questions as we go along. So the first uh, priority that I will just launch right into is that there is a need among people with sickle cell disease and providers in the general healthcare system to really recognize that sickle cell disease is complex. Now, you all as sickle cell warriors know that, but some providers just think about sickle cell as, as one complication or symptom, which is pain. They don't think about the fact that sickle cell disease uh, affects every organ system and um, everywhere blood flows, sickle cell disease can cause damage. But further, you have uh, policies and healthcare systems and structures, which I'll talk about a little bit more later in, in terms of structural racism and other structures and policies that really impact people's care when they have sickle cell disease. And then there are issues related to uh, sociocultural issues, uh, anxiety, depression, stress, all of those can um, enhance uh, the bad experiences related to sickle cell disease, such as pain. And then, you know, there are differences in terms of uh, genomics that we still don't understand, uh, climate, uh, nutrition, activity, behavioral. So all of these, sickle cell disease is very complex and it really needs to be recognized as such. And this just is an illustration of how it really does impact um, any and all organ systems. And so there's a strong need, and I think Dr. Uh, Hager talked about it, to really uh, it, be engaged in preventive care, um, to do screenings, and uh, to really have a partnership with uh, your outpatient provider, a sickle cell specialist. The second priority I'm going to talk about is pain management. So sickle cell disease is different from almost all other pain syndromes. The onset is in infancy. And so what that means is that people are exposed to medical induced traumas. That is um, IV starts, uh, perhaps even if brief separation from the parent in infancy, uh, exposure to opioids and exposure to really extreme pain. And so that's there aren't other pain syndromes that are like this. Despite this, the providers overest the risk of addiction for patients with sickle cell disease compared with other chronic pain syndromes. And there is evidence to the contrary that other chronic pain syndromes actually have a higher risk of addiction compared to sickle cell disease. And so families consistently report that they're discriminated against, misbelieved, and mistreated within the healthcare system. One example of uh, a bias in managing sickle cell related pain episodes that many of you may have already heard about is this study that Carlton Haywood uh, conducted. So he and his team reviewed um, more than 170,000 emergency department visit records. And they were looking at wait times to see a physician. And they compared people with sickle cell disease to all other conditions, but particularly pain related to long bone fracture. And what they found was that patients with sickle cell disease experienced wait times that were 25% longer than the general patient sample. And that the fact that the many people with sickle cell disease or the majority of people with sickle cell disease are of African-American race did play a, a role in that. But they also did this analysis where they looked at comparison with the long bone fracture and found that patients waited 50% longer than people with fractures. Uh, and that was even accounting for black race and that people should have been assigned a higher triage priority. So there are guidelines and there have been guidelines um, to manage pain, but they haven't been well utilized. Um, and the guidelines really talk about how essential it is to determine where the pain's located, what the intensity of the pain is, what the quality of the pain is, but also what are other symptoms? And if providers really stopped and thought about that people could have different uh, ways that they metabolize opioids or that uh, a person who is uh, small in the provider's eyes and yet needs a large um, 
dose, dose of uh, pain medications, these things can be ignored by providers. But within guidelines, it really suggests that you have to really individualize how you care for people in pain with sickle cell disease. And then this is the, the data from the CDC that showed that less than 1% of sickle cell deaths were related to opioids during the opioid crisis compared with 3% of deaths uh, in other non-cancer pain conditions. So again, evidence that uh, the risk of addiction is not higher for people with sickle cell disease. What's important though, is that frequent pain can be a risk factor for mortality. So it needs to be taken seriously. The impact of biases in managing pain is that patients report that they'll delay seeking care even for potentially life-threatening events due to these negative experiences. In this interesting study that was done um, and presented at ASH, uh, American Society of Hematology in 2017, adult men with sickle cell disease reported a perception of a significant lack of safety. So when they went in to receive care for acute vasoclusive of episodes, they express concerns about medication errors, about being misdiagnosed. And, and, you know, I really think about this statistic that even compared with women with sickle cell disease in this study, men really reported feeling unsafe. And if you contrast that with this country where uh, Black men are considered threats and that people express feeling unsafe in some Black men's presence, and yet here you see that the reality that men are feeling that they aren't safe in the healthcare system. And more, more recently, there have been um, thoughts about how this, these biases in pain management actually could make pain worse. So in this, um, study, not just because the person is waiting, uh, you know, too long to receive medicine or see a provider. But in this study, they asked uh, adolescents, uh, children and adolescents, you know, did you experience uh, what we would call injustice, pain related injustice, so biases in your pain management. And when people said that they experienced that, they also reported worse pain, greater pain catastrophizing, which is a, a poor coping strategy for dealing with pain. They reported more functional disability, so they weren't able to function with their pain and they were emotionally distressed. So the pain-related stigma actually impacts the pain experience itself and makes it worse. And um, we've already mentioned that, you know, this partnership with the healthcare providers is really impacted by experiencing the stigma and mistrust in the healthcare system. And even further, there's a thought that there could be um, an impact on actually the neurobiology. So when a person develops into having chronic pain, uh, it could be related to this pain-related stigma. This is a huge area where there's research needed, but it's important to think about that that stress from that uh, those biases and stigma uh, could be causing some challenges. So when we say, okay, I, I said, you know, pain is a priority, pain management is a priority. What does adequate treatment of pain look like? Well, it looks like a philosophy that people with sickle cell disease deserve the best quality of life and relief from pain. It looks like listening to patients and respecting their self-reports in the acute setting, that other symptoms and potential complications are assessed that decisions are based on, on assessments, not just on the, the provider's opinion about what the patient should be getting. And the individualized pain plans need to be implemented more. Um, and these would include, you know, patients outpatient analgesic use, knowledge of what works for them, and minimization of side effects as they get um, a range of medications and not exclusively opioids. The third priority that I'd like to mention is person family care, person family centered care. This would go a long way if people with sickle cell disease were truly seen as the center of their care, the people with sickle cell disease and their families, and that providers were, were respectful and treated patients with dignity, allowed choice, uh, really support for possible living and self-determination. 
to the person's capacity. So I, I name this as a priority because um, sickle cell disease has been so vulnerable to, to structures that don't think about the individual person and what that person needs, but rather there are structures built in that uh, really uh, lead to this discrimination, biases, and so on. And when you have the person and the family at the center of their care, then you have a focus on uh, uh, these domains of how well do they get around? What are their social relationships? What is their uh, thoughts about their overall health, not just health related to sickle cell disease? What symptoms are they experiencing? How can they accomplish everyday tasks? And how are emotions at play here? So when um, for, for people with sickle cell disease, as I, as I put forward how important it is to consider the, the person at the center, then the person's quality of life is really what's valued and what's supported. The fourth priority I wanted to comment on is um, transition from uh, pediatric to adult care. Uh, yeah, and I, and I may be going through these really fast. We can go back to any of these. If you have a question uh, or comment, um, we'll have discussion, plenty of discussion time at the end, but I just wanted to lay out priorities that are not just, again, my opinions, but also, um, priorities that are out there in terms of uh, grant funding, projects that are happening, um, uh, yeah, and just priorities on federal levels and so on. And I'm glad that quality of life is a focus of advocacy and empowerment. So what is the problem in terms of transition uh, with sickle cell disease? Well, um, this graph hasn't changed much since this uh, data came out or was published in 2005 from the Sickle Cell Data Collection Project in California. And so the bars are showing you the total number of patients and the line is showing you the number of emergency department visits uh, that are total. And so you, you know that when children with sickle cell disease or babies with sickle cell disease, the parent is encouraged to bring the child in at the first sign of any kind of emergency We because it can save lives. So the average number of uh, uh, emergency department visits or the total number you can see uh, is about um, 500 for uh, these children in the less than 10 category for over a whole year across the state of California. And it still remains pretty low um, in, in this first next period of life, 10 to 19 years, but then you see a really dramatic increase so that there are more emergency department visits than people uh, when, when you're in the young adult years. And we do think or know that part of this is related to the failures of the healthcare system there may be changes as far as um, the disease itself. So it's more important than ever for, the, for people, young people, to be seeking that outpatient care screenings, partnership with their healthcare provider. Um, and yet many rely on the emergency department, unfortunately, because there are so few adult providers available. And so then it remains high, higher than the number of people that is a number of emergency room visits across life. And then this shows a 30-day emergency department readmission rate, and it's a similar trend. So a readmission rate is, is uh, sickle cell disease does have the highest 30-day readmission rate of any condition in the U.S. What that suggests is that people are getting poor care, being released from the hospital or the emergency room before the problem is actually solved, and so then they have to come back within 30 days. So in the... Uh, 10, less than 10 and 10 to 19 years, less than 30% of the visit or around 30% are have these 30 day readmissions. But again, dramatic increase to almost 60% in that 20 to 29 age group, and then it stays high. So there's a there is a lot of focus now on supporting successful transition. And um, this article um, that is a global perspective on transition from pediatric to adult care, uh, Dr. Baba Inusa is the first author and a number of us from around the world actually contributed to thinking about 
what is needed as far as um, adequate transition from pediatric to adult care and, and, and across uh, the world, not just in the US. So the first, um, the S is for skills transfer, I for increased self-efficacy. So there's a lot of data that shows this. Um, coordination of care. This is really important so that this issue where people lose uh, coordinated care uh, between pediatric and adult is, is not acceptable. It does happen all over the world. Knowledge transfer. So if people with sickle cell disease need to be well educated, which again, this uh, series of workshops is doing, educating people about what the disease is about, what does it take to stay well. Linking intentionally to adult services and then evaluating readiness. So um, for young people uh, who may be on this call, if your provider in pediatrics did not ask you, you know, are you ready? Do you know enough to take care of your sickle cell disease as an adult? Uh, do you know enough to um, function as an adult um, in terms of uh, finances and money management? Um, how are you doing in terms of your mental health and your emotional well-being? So your pediatric provider should be evaluating your readiness and then relaying that information to your adult provider so they can continue to support you once you've moved into adult care. And um, I put forward this chart um, that is about really this partnership between the young person their parent or guardian and the provider. And um, what I wanted people to think about in looking at this chart is that the parent or the guardian actually still has a role, even when the young person moves into adult care. So with any chronic condition, support is needed, support is necessary. And so an expectation that a young person is just gonna be able to manage their own care at 18, 21, People always need support, particularly when you have a chronic condition like sickle cell disease. So over time, I think about the young person as receiving care from the provider who has a major responsibility for really directing the medical care. And then the parent or guardian provides care in the home. So the, the provider is really responsible to educate, to support, to make sure that um, the family knows about um, disease modifying therapies, again, screenings and so on. As the young person gets older, then they participate in their care. They aren't just a passive receiver of the care. The parent or guardian is managing along with the um, young person and the provider supports the parent and the child. So the responsibility begins to shift to the young person and the parent guardian. And the reason is, is that you only see your provider, even if you see your provider a lot, it's still only a fraction of your life away from the healthcare system. So what you're doing outside of the healthcare system in terms of your nutrition, your exercise, your preventive care, the, the young person, and the parent need to start to manage that. And then the young person manages themselves, the parent becomes a supervisor and the provider a consultant. And then the young person is the supervisor of their care. Uh, the parent or guardian is the con consultant and the provider becomes a resource. Now, this is more about, you know, ongoing day-to-day -day care. Of course, if you're in the hospital with acute chest syndrome, then the major responsibility goes back to the provider because they know what to do to prevent um, you know, a severe outcome related to, let's say, acute chest. But when you're talking about, you know, I need to manage my pain so that I can work, so that I can go to school, um, then that's when the young person is the supervisor of their care and the provider is a resource. I was looking at a chat note, but it was, uh, I don't know if I should read it now. I think I'll wait and, and read it um, Unless, uh, Karen, if you would like to comment on what you put in the chat now, then we can stop, but otherwise we can keep going. Point of discussion or, or question right now? Let's see. Oh, later is fine, okay, <laughs> great. All right, so um, 
The next priority I wanted to touch on is what's called team-based science. So um, discovery isn't about um, you know, a brilliant person in the lab anymore making a discovery and then it, it moves into improving the lives of people um, in with sickle cell disease in this case. Science has really moved to a team and the team includes the community. The team includes people with sickle cell disease. So this is um, a newer concept in, in science because I'm sure many of you have seen movies, you know, and, and seen... Um, sort of these brilliant discoveries that people like Albert Einstein, let's say, would make. But that's not how science works anymore. It has to be a team. So in sickle cell disease or in any clinical translational research, the team also has to look at this continuum where you start with the basic science. So some sort of lab discovery that happens. And then you uh, move to studies that translate that to humans. So there are studies where they check the safety and the efficacy of, let's say, again, a disease modifying therapy or gene editing. Then you translate that to patients. So you have clinical trials. But I think the place where people maybe miss a little bit is that it's really important from there to translate it into practice. So great discoveries like hydroxyurea, um, these disease modifying therapies that you heard about, gene editing, curative therapies, it doesn't help if it doesn't make it into practice. It doesn't help if you're seeing a provider who doesn't know about it or doesn't talk with you about it, what it means for you. And then ultimately it has to be translated to a population so that the whole population with sickle cell disease becomes better, becomes healthier because of these discoveries that were made in the lab, the discovery that hydroxyurea increases fetal hemoglobin or the discovery that um, newer medications increase uh, hemoglobin or oxygen affinity, the, the oxygen stays attached to the red blood cell. So those are basic science discoveries, but it has to make it to people with sickle cell disease so that it benefits everyone. And how it makes it is what's called dissemination and implementation research. What that refers to is that we have to figure out how do we get a great discovery that's helping patients at Johns Hopkins to um, the program in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah? How do we implement um, some of these findings with populations in you know, Washington state or Texas or so on? So there are different ways that healthcare systems are set up in across the country. And, um, and so um, it's important to uh, really look at this dissemination and implementation. And dissemination just means that the, um, you know, the findings are uh, released or uh, be a are available to providers and patients. And then implementation means that it, again, it's implemented or actually benefits the person because they are taking the disease modifying therapy or, or participating with curative therapies. And yes, someone asked, did Dr. Hager already present? And that answer is yes. Um, so there um, is a consortium, which is called the Sickle Cell Disease Implementation Consortium. And we came together in 2016, uh, eight sites around the US. You can see one of them is here in California at uh, the University of Cal California in San Francisco. And, and we actually um, did a needs assessment. So again, partnered with the community, providers in the community, people with sickle cell disease to understand what is it that's needed right now to improve um, life and care of people with sickle cell disease. And one important study that we launched and have completed, although the data is still being analyzed, was a study called ALIGN, which, um, uh, refers to a study where we were implementing individualized pain plans. So we knew there was some data, some data that individualized pain plans work, but how do you scale that up? How do you get those out across the U.S.? Well, you still have to do a 
relatively small study in just eight sites of the implementation consortium. And we did this study where we uh, worked with sickle cell providers to write out the individualized pain plan. But the unique thing about the study is that we made sure the individualized pain plans were in the same place every time in the electronic health record. Further, the pain plan was accessed on the patient's uh, cell phone through their patient portal. So this required the, the outpatient provider, the sickle cell specialist and the patient to sit down, review the individualized pain plan and how to use it. And then that way, when the person ended up with an emergency department visit, then they would show that they had an individualized pain plan and also the provider at the emergency room, uh, one of the eight emergency rooms knew that they had a pain plan and would, and would follow it. And um, so these were the responsibilities when the patient did go in with pain that the, the emergency department provider would review the individualized pain plan. And um, that, um, again, it would be more of a partnership in the emergency department. And so we, uh, again, we've completed this data collection, but not published it yet or finished the analyses uh, where we had people just do surveys to let us know how the new plan worked. So in other words, um, in, previously, there weren't individualized pain plans that were in wide use, or the individualized pain plans would be very different from one another. Um, letters, uh, it, you, the provider couldn't find it, and certainly the person with sickle cell disease couldn't access it. And uh, in this way, we made sure that um, the pain plan was in the electronic health record. So we're excited that we're moving to the place where we will be able to present results about what we found with the study. And so somewhat related, I'm gonna move into the next priority I wanted to touch on, which is advocacy and anti-racism. So sickle cell disease is characterized, unfortunately, by health outcome disparities. So a health outcome disparity would be related to, for example, that life expectancy can be shorter for people with the most severe form of the disease. And we already talked about the 30-day readmission rate, that this is the highest among all conditions in the country. And then the types of complications that people with sickle cell disease experience are higher than other rates for other individuals. Uh, so such as stroke, pain, infection, and so on. So outcomes are, are the results of the medical condition itself and they affect the length and quality of the person's life. So there are health resource disparities in sickle cell disease and health resources um, uh, are um, the materials, personnel, facilities, funds, and so on that can be used to provide health care and services. So the majority of sickle cell patients um, in this country are Medicaid beneficiaries. Um, and then less than 70% um, of physicians in the US accept new Medicaid patients. So this is limiting access to care. We've already touched on that healthcare providers uh, may inaccurately perceive patients as drug seekers. And, and as a result, they're biased. Patients wait longer to see the physician and get pain medicine. And then in adult care, for sure, the number of physicians is still limited uh, in who are willing and trained to take care of people with sickle cell disease. And Pat, I'll get back, I'll get to your question um, when we get to the discussion phase. So the, the um, foundation of health resource and outcome disparities is funding, which is due to structural racism. So let's look at this. So sickle cell disease affects 100,000 people in the US, and that's uh, shaded blue here, and compare cystic fibrosis, which affects primarily whites uh, and affects about 30,000 people uh, in the US. So funding for research, you already see the problem here. So here's cystic fibrosis gets more than half of the funding and sickle cell a little bit less, despite these numbers, this should be the proportion. 
And then phil philanthropic or found foundation funding is even worse, where there's limited funds that come to sickle cell disease from philanthropy. And um, so average funding per person is, um, you know, 10 times that for cystic fibrosis and sickle cell disease. And what this does, it delays that discovery that I was talking with you about earlier and implementation into practice. Without adequate funding, there's not research that's happening in the lab. There's not you know, five disease modifying therapies a year that you get in cystic fibrosis where sickle cell disease has five disease modifying therapies total. So this funding really impacts discovery and then implementation into practice. It's, it's really significant and it is due to structural racism. So when you, you know, how to address the priority is to use an anti-racist framework and to name it. So just be intentional about naming what the issue is. In the U.S., sickle cell disease primarily affects African-Americans. We know, and it was really highlighted with the COVID-19 pandemic, but we knew before that, that racism exists. The important point about racism is, though, that it's not just about those who are targeted, the people of color, uh, people with disabilities, uh, you know, people who um, are uh, gender fluid. When you have racism, then it really saps the strength of all because if everyone isn't getting adequate health care, then the whole system is impacted. And so we have to recognize and rectify historical injustices. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about how to do that shortly. Uh, resources have to be provided according to need. And in the case of the excitement about curative therapy, therapies now, we can't lose sight that there's still a need for access to quality care. Not everyone is gonna be eligible for these curative therapies. It's a little ways out. So we don't wanna shift and be focused on curative therapies at the expense of really improving the quality of care. And so dismantling racism requires a focus on structures and policies such as individualized pain plan. So that's a change in structure. The emergency department provider can find the pl plan now. So that can change things on that level. And whether or not the provider still is biased, they, they can just go to the individualized pain plan and implement it. Um, so that's focused on structure. But we also want that provider to recognize that they are biased and to do some training and education about what the impact of bias is on um, healthcare. As a person with sickle cell disease, um, you have rights. And so this Speak Up Against Discrimination initiative came out of the Joint Commissions, which does accredit hospitals and healthcare systems. And the Speak Up Against Discrimination outlines patient rights. You have the right to timely and appropriate care that is free from discrimination. And, and that's almost innovative because people with sickle cell disease haven't experienced timely and appropriate care that is free from discrimination. But that is your right according to the joint commissions, according to what's right about good health care. You have a right to be treated with courtesy and respect. And if English is not your preferred language, you have a right to an interpreter. And the Joint Commissions goes further to provide you with some steps to take if you are being discriminated against. Within every hospital, uh, there's a policy for reporting complaints. In our hospital, uh, where I work, uh, um, it's, it's called um, RL Solutions Incident Reporting. And um, everyone can access it and you file your complaint. It's confidential. And it... Um, it, it can be dealt with in appropriate channels. There are patient advocates within uh, hospitals and healthcare systems. And then you can also go further and file a complaint with the Office of Civil Rights. Now, I mentioned that, again, in our hospital, we have an incident reporting system. It's not perfect by any means. People don't know it exists. People don't use it. And so this is where we need to bring this awareness that you need to start speaking up. You need to start filing these complaints and so that they're kept in a very systematic way. And then the Joint Commission, lastly, asks that you send them information. So if you've tried these other avenues, send them this information. I was uh, about three weeks ago in a Joint Commission um, 
review of our health of our hospital. And so it's real. They do come out and they do evaluate how things are doing. And so if you, if they start to get a lot of complaints about a given hospital, um, then we would hope that something will start to be done. So there are partnerships that have been effective um, in California in 2018. So the advocacy is so important. We had physicians, uh, looks like Antoine right there in the middle, <laughs> uh, Nadina here. So we had physicians, people with sickle cell disease, advocates, um, policymakers, researchers, epidemiologists, and um, we wrote and um, put forward this executive summary of an action plan to improve sickle cell care in California. It was focused on adult care because that is what this group determined, a group of oh, about 50 people um, needed to be focused on. And so the um, summary was taken by our colleagues in Southern California to the state and it was approved and then ultimately resulted in funding for the network in California for sickle cell care. Then across the country, uh, quite recently, uh, this Addressing Sickle Cell Disease Strategic Plan and Blueprint for Action, again, very intentionally names racism, intentionally names the need for, uh, actually outlines steps to really address uh, issues with sickle cell disease. So I would urge you to read the summary of this report because it really is a good blueprint, uh, again, that was come to by a number of people who are experts from around the country, people with sickle cell disease and um, advocates and so on. The Cure Sickle Cell Initiative uh, is a very, has an uh, excellent partnership between people with sickle cell disease and researchers. The Sickle Cell Disease Coalition is a broad-based uh, coalition that's global. The Sickle Cell Disease Partnership is behind the legislation that Chris Van Hollen is uh, sponsoring along with Barbara Lee to establish and maintain sickle cell centers around the U.S., um, you know, supporting uh, half a billion dollars towards what's needed to take care of people with sickle cell disease in the U.S. And uh, so this is the Sickle Cell Care Expansion Act, again, that Chris Van Hollen is um uh, sponsoring. I don't know if, okay, I thought someone had a question. Um, okay, so we'll keep going. Um, another really, another um, initiative that's new, but very important is the National Alliance of Sickle Cell Centers. So this is also an organization that's just two years old. Um, it has an executive uh, board, it has a board of directors, it has um, a, a mechanism for evaluating sickle cell programs in the U.S. and then recognizing them as providing comprehensive care. Um, so we now have 76 centers that have been um, identified um, uh, or recognized by the National Alliance of Sickle Cell Centers. There's still a lot of work here, but what we thought was important by starting the National Alliance of Sickle Cell Center is that at least it's a, it's a start. I mean, these programs aren't perfect, um, but they have essential ingredients um, as we wrote about in an article that um, is being looked at by the Health Resource and Service Administration um, and and it's a, it's a starting place to come up with real certification of sickle cell centers. Um, but for now, the groups get together, the providers would want to bring the uh, community-based organizations in more to work more closely with this. But um, but we're excited that in two years that we have 76 people, 76 centers that are interested in taking care of people with sickle cell disease and doing it right. Um, the color coding is purple for lifespan, uh, red for adult, and then blue for pediatric. So, you know, in, in hearkening back to what I talked about in terms of the um, team-based science and, and the holistic models, sickle cell disease has really suffered because of health inequities. And we need a holistic approach to improve that. And, and that includes advocacy, such as within these groups uh, that I named. And so change is needed everywhere. It does start in the laboratory, 
but then it goes all the way to health policy. And for us, we, you know, whatever level we are, whatever our role as providers, as advocates, as people living with sickle cell disease, as family members, this is our time to be courageous. And some of us have been this all along, but others had to learn it or really uh, push ourselves to speak our truths, to be unafraid of controversy, to embrace these challenges and know that um, you know our growing edge is at the edge of our comfort. So this isn't gonna be a comfortable process to address these sickle cell disease health inequities once and for all, but it has to happen. But it also takes collectivity. We have to think about this as a whole so that we have to organize and work together collectively. It's not, a, it's not about one person or one organization. It's about all of us working together. So the, um, I think this may be my last priority, which is the global perspective. So as challenging as it is to think about the disparities that are at play in the U.S., with approximately 100,000 people in this country, just consider that more than 300,000 babies are born every year in Sub-Saharan African Africa, and many of those will not make it to their fifth birthday. So some of the things that we do now, some of the advocacy that we put forward, um, participating in clinical trials so that we know what works and, and how to implement it in uh, lower resource settings, this is gonna help save lives across the world. Um, and the last thing I wanted to talk about, so those are the priorities, like I said, in different spaces that I'm in, in, um, in uh, sickle cell disease, both globally, nationally, and locally, those are the priorities that um, I'm observing, that I'm experiencing, and that have been named. So now I wanted to update you about the Sickle Cell Center of Excellence. Um, and um, let you know that the first patient was seen in 1973. So that means that this is our 50th year of existence. So Dr. Bert Lubin, um, who many of you um, have heard of and known, he saw the first patient with sickle cell disease in 1973 at uh, Children's Hospital in Oakland. In 74, uh, sickle cell screening and counseling education program started um, the actual comprehensive sickle cell center funded by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute in Oakland and San Francisco uh, was started in 75. And, and the California Newborn Hemoglobin Screening Program was also started that year. And again, this was a program that literally saved lives, decreasing mortality and in infancy from about 10%. And it can be 0% in a high resource setting where people are identified and taught what to look for started on pen, uh, penicillin prophylaxis. Um, and our center, so this is about the UCSF Sickle Cell Center of Excellence, under Dr. Vrachinsky's leadership, we have been on the forefront of every major um, uh, discovery. Uh, we, we're uh, dedicated, we're committed, we have an infrastructure, have had an infrastructure, sometimes it was a little shaky, but, um, but we've been able to participate in the cooperative study of sickle cell disease, um, looking at red cell adhesion to the walls of the blood vessels, and these kinds of discoveries lead to, um, uh, you know, uh, medications and disease modifying therapies. Uh, Dr. Mark Walters uh, uh, actually led the, some of the first blood and bone marrow transplant cures in sickle cell disease. Uh, we've participated in stroke prevention um, and demonstrated uh, changes in brain functioning for adults. Now, we, we kind of snuck in here an issue that is more about um, the social fabric of, of the care for sickle cell disease. So um, these discoveries early on were really related to pediatrics. So the national sickle cell centers were uh, funded primarily to pediatric programs and adult care was left to the community and to community benefit programs. In 99 in our area, um, there was an adult program in a local hospital, but it was closed because it was considered a community benefit hospital uh, program. And so the adults ended up at Children's Hospital in Oakland for care. I mean, Dr. Vichinsky looked around for places where people could be taken care of, but wasn't able to establish 
uh, the infrastructure that was needed for good adult care. And so now we do have a lifespan center uh, and we're one of the first uh, in the country where we have adult providers who you heard from earlier today, caring for people with sickle cell disease who are adults and we have pediatric providers. So as a lifespan center, it's not that everyone sees everyone. It's just that we are able to share uh, nurse coordinators and office staff and so on. And that really uh, streamlines things. And moving forward, um, we participated and continue to participate with the CDC and the Registry and Surveillance Program, um, the Sickle Cell Disease Implementation Consortium I mentioned, um, myself and Dr. Walters participate in the Sickle in Africa Consortium. Uh, Dr. Walters is a leader in the Cure Sickle Cell Initiative, and he, in fact, received the largest grant in the Benioff Children's Hospital Oakland history for his gene editing trial. Um, we participated in the Voxellator trials. And then our newest initiative is looking at linking people who uh, are not receiving sickle cell specialty care to sickle cell specialty care. Um, and, and we can say in here as well that we have where initially we were in San Francisco and Oakland, but then those two programs split off. Now they've come back together. And um, so we're really uh, looking towards uh, a revitalized Sickle Cell Center of Excellence that um, is Cross Bay in the Bay Area. Um, and there's uh, Dr. Vachinsky, excuse me, Dr. Lubin, Dr. Vachinsky, but this is our team now researchers, uh, neuropsychologists, uh, administrators, Dr. Rivers, who's a um, basic researcher. Um, so our team is, is robust um, and we're really moving forward in terms of, of really establishing an infrastructure that's across um, the Bay Area, not just in Oakland or just in San Francisco. So our mission, um, we want to uh, improve clinical outcomes and also quality of life. And we do it across the lifespan. Um, and um, so again, but we recognize adult care is so vulnerable. Here we are at a glance, uh, over $12 million in grants and gifts, uh, very prolific in terms of writing and publishing. We're really proud that we are training uh, providers on their health disparities and implicit biases. Um, we've had, we educate community members, uh, through big and small forums, and we have a community advisory board, um, where we have people with sickle cell disease or family members or advocates who are, uh, partnering with us in different ways. Some review educational materials, some are helping us with research, uh, some are helping us think about how to really strengthen the, um, uh, UCSF, Sickle Cell Center of Excellence. So uh, again, <clears throat> we, we serve about four, almost 450 uh, of the over 1,200 people with sickle cell disease. Now, a third of these 1,200 people are in Kaiser system. So um, we are looking, but we're looking towards that unaffiliated patient project where we can bring in people who are not seeing sickle cell specialists in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, let's see what else. And so we have different grants. We actually wrote standard of care guidelines that are being disseminated and I can send the link to you all. Um, we educate uh, not only providers uh, in our sickle cell boot camps, but also genetic counselors and um, single gene counselors in uh, Ghana. Um, we have specialty care available, although we did lose funding uh, temporarily, we hope, for our neuropsychologists, so we hope to get that funding back. I mean, so it's still pretty shaky with sickle cell disease. Uh, our research, um, we're a number of collaboratives. Uh, again, we have a focus on health equity and inclusion. And here we are, as I said, at our 50th anniversary celebration this year. Uh, there's a podcast that uh, you might find interesting that really out lays out the history of sickle cell care in the Bay Area. Uh, again, I can send the link to the podcast and some events coming up. Um, Oakland Museum of California, uh, May 16th, uh, we'll do a presentation on um, uh, the history of sickle cell um, in Oakland, uh, African American Museum and Library at Oakland. Note the date, June 17th, and I don't want to steal Antoine's thunder, but 
He'll talk about this more, sickle cell walk, <laughs> camp superstar. Uh, and then we're going to have a reception in October, and November. So we'll be sending out save the dates for all of you who can um, join. So that was a whirlwind tour of priorities for sickle cell disease care and research. And I want to hear from you about what priorities resonate with you. What can we do for you as a UCSF Sickle Cell Center of Excellence? And how might we all work together for advocacy? So I'm going to stop sharing so that we can have a discussion and I can answer the questions that came into the chat. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so for first thing, um, one was from Pat Corley. It said, uh, Marsha, how often were pain plans utilized? Were hospitals receptive to using? Um, it's a really excellent question, Pat. Thank you for that question. Um, I'll, I'll admit a, a bit of a limitation of the project was that we, um, and you wouldn't necessarily consider it a limitation. So the emergency departments were partnered with sickle cell programs already. So, but that did, but, it, but, but the important thing is they weren't using individualized pain plans prior to the project. However, because we already had a relationship with the emergency departments, they were well utilized. Um, and, and um, but, and so, you know, so that's the, the first phase of the project is to just see, can we create something where the, everyone can find it whenever they need it? Um, and do they like it? And how well did it work just, just in a very controlled way? The next step will be to start to, um, you know, spread it out across the country. And then we'll start to look at, okay, where are places where these plans are not well utilized and, you know, what are barriers to utilization? And, but the, the providers were very receptive. Um, the emergency department providers, um, uh, were, were very receptive. They wanted to be able to find the plan in the same place every time. And they said that was one of the biggest benefits. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm muting myself. Uh, my question was about the hospitalists. Are the hospitalists using it? Because in the adult um, um, hospitals, they contract with hospitalists that come in and now provide a lot of the care to people with sickle cell disease um, when they're in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we've run into is a resistance with the hospitalists, I you know, see. and and wanting to make their own decisions about how they should uh, take care of people with sickle cell disease. Right. And what, what mm -hmm. the other thing that that that's really a concern to me is that when we talk about um, care for people with sickle cell disease, mm -hmm. uh, and we talk about guidelines for care. Mm -hmm. There's no mandate that makes people follow those guidelines. Mm -hmm. And so, right. so we often run into a problem with, um, they, they'll say, yeah, I, I've seen the guidelines before, but this is the way I'm gonna do it, you know? So, so it is really, really difficult. It's, it's easier in the pediatric population. It's mm -hmm. extremely difficult in the adult population mm -hmm. to get the care that you need we will have people who come in with pulmonary problems and they ha they're they having a painful episode. Mm -hmm. The doctors will agree to treat their pulmonary symptoms, mm -hmm. but will not agree to medicate for the pain, you mm -hmm. know? So, so there's a major, you know, a major battle that has to go on all the time for adults living with sickle cell disease mm -hmm. in order for them to get what they need. Yeah. And then, and then my other question to you is that I know that we have a group and we've determined who centers of excellence are and how they should look, mm -hmm. but who reviews those? Are those just mm -hmm. left up to your group who identifies them? Are they reviewed um, by others um, mm -hmm. who, who can give you some real input into how those are working? for people living with sickle cell disease? Yeah, yeah, all, all great questions. So <clears throat> let me uh, tackle the hospitalist question. Um, uh, you're right, hospitalists, that's a frontier that needs to be kind of knocked down. They, the, the hospitalists do make their own decisions. And, um, you know, I think, Pat, you might've been in, in one of our lectures with uh, Steve Long, who we're fortunate to have a pain specialist, you know, uh, who's a part of our team. And 
he would have to go in on, you know, Sunday night <laughs> to help the hospitalist to not change the plan or to do it right, you know, that kind of thing. And not every place is going to have that or even have someone like him who actually, uh, re, you know, writes the plans and reviews them in the first place. So that's a big issue. I mean, I agree with you that we need to um, really work out that area. I think the emergency department uh, care is is getting better. So the American College of Emergency Physicians, I mean, it's getting better in the sense that there are tools available. So the American College of Emergency Physicians did put out a point of care um, tool that I'll also send you the link to that um, was written by emergency providers um, and, and says what you need to do if you have a person with sickle cell disease in front of you. And it says you need to listen to them and talk to them. So it's a, it's a great tool and it's really aligned with how the sickle cell community would want it to, what they would want it to say. But again, that's in the... Um, uh, emergency medicine realm. And so that's giving me the idea that in terms of advocacy, sort of another level would be these hospitalists because we haven't really tackled it yet. Um, and I, I agree, it's really important to tackle. Um, the second question um, you had asked, um, well, I actually, I'm not remembering, but actually Nadina wrote about the guidelines are only good if they're taken into, oh, uh, accreditation. Okay. So the National Alliance of Sickle Cell Centers, um, again, it's it's new. I mean, it's a new organization and, and we will be the first to say that we have a long way to go, but we had to get started and we have to move as fast as we can to get us to where we need to be. So what we're doing is... Um, Right now, there's a part of the National Alliance of Sickle Cell Centers that reviews applications from the centers who want to be recognized. Um, and, the, and the committee that reviews the applications is led by Sophie Lanskron. So that's someone who knows what, it, what care should look like and then, uh, for the adults. And then for PEDS, the person who reviews the lead is uh, Deepa Manwani, who's a pediatric provider. So we feel like that's an important first step, but it's not the end. We aren't at the end because we're reading what the they say they're doing, okay? And we recognize they're saying what they do. No one's gone out and looked. N they haven't given us data yet about what, what they're really doing. So we're taking it on faith that these individuals who don't get really anything out of being a part of the National Alliance of Sickle Cell Centers other than support, access to guidelines, access to colleagues, we're taking it on face value that they want to be there, that they want to do better, that they want to do the best that they can. So the next step is going to be what, how does the patient, how do patients and families rate that uh, facility? So you say in Portland that you have a pediatric sickle cell center and we want you now to start submitting. What did your patients and families, what's their satisfaction with your program? And then ultimately, yes, it's going to be site visits and, you know, rigorous evaluations, but we're, we're just starting and um, this is where, where we're starting. <laughs> so, so I, I, can I get a list of the people that are on that committee? Yeah. Because, because I, you know, I, you know, I have some concerns about it, you know, and I, you, you and I have both been in sickle cell for 50 years. Yes, we have. And, and so the, I don't know. I, I'm sure you clearly remember that we used to have site visits, mm -hmm. you know, and so the the NIH came to us and visited our facility, Absolutely. right? To right. Sure that we were doing what we said we were doing and right. we do things. I don't see that happening nowadays, and I and the quality of of what is termed a sickle cell center is not the quality that we had before, where we provided a lot of different services for clients and ensure that things got taken care of in the way they should be taken care of. Yeah. And as a person who's almost ready to leave the sickle cell community, mm -hmm. I want to ensure that I leave it better than it was when I, I came right. to it. You know? <clears throat> so, so I would like for us, even some of the nurses that are on International Association of Sickle Cell Nurses and, mm -hmm. and professional associates, we have not been invited to have a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I think that for me, me for one, I want to have a seat at the table because okay. I want to see what people are doing. Yeah, you know, and hold them accountable. You know, I'm mm -hmm. not afraid to bite my tongue. 
No, you aren't. <laughs> uh, and so, so those, those are just some of the things that I want to put out there. I think that, that we have not, because we ask not a lot of times. Um, and I think the population needs to know what's going on yeah. with us in terms of, we, we now have a certain number of uh, centers of excellence across the country, but that's not what I'm hearing from clients as I go to different support groups and, okay. and as I, you know, embrace relationships with clients across the country. Mm -hmm. They're not saying that their, their care is any better than it was before. So what yeah. are we not doing right um, that is, is not leading us to where we want to go? You know? Yeah. No, I, I agree totally. And and it's an excellent suggestion that we need do need to bring the voice of the nurses to the table. So I'll take this back to the executive committee for NASAC. And uh, and again, know that site visits is, is the future state, but um, that would take funding. And, um, and so I, I definitely hope with the, um, you know, the Sickle Cell Ex Care Expansion Act that it, you know, I think a lot of us have had input as they're writing that legislation. What is it really going to take? It's not going to take a loose structure, you know, to get people to do the right care for people with sickle cell disease. It's going to take, you know, a strong structure where there's uh, oversight and, um, uh, you know, again, a real close uh, monitoring of what's really going on and hearing from the people who are getting the care. So, um, and so, not yeah. guidelines, mandates. I want yes. mandates, mm -hmm. yeah. okay? Yeah. So that you have to follow things. Mm -hmm. You know, right. we're, we we suggest you do this. That's not that's not um, that's not hard enough mm -hmm. to get people to do it. No, it's so. true. I, I totally agree. And I mean, I think that the good thing about the um, legislation and some of these efforts is is really looking at what's worked in other conditions and uh, you know there's strong oversight in cystic fibrosis centers there's strong oversight in hemophilia treatment centers so we shouldn't be any different and um but we don't have the funding yet to do what's needed to make that happen so um yeah so i agree with you and i'm in the chapter of my life where i also want to see these things come to fruition so I do, uh, you know, feel strongly about us all working together to make this happen. Yeah, and, and I just want to say that I I uh, support everything that Pat says, and I want to be on that, be at that table as well, just to see how these guidelines are being put together. But I want to back up for a second and find out about these hospitalists. Mm -hmm. I mean, do they exist? Because I've heard of them and I've dealt with them, but it doesn't seem like they're around they're either sparse or i mean yes. i just don't know that's why the i dina, the chat is there a list of these people the dina, they who has a hospital list they absolutely do exist and they are contracted to the facility to cover so that they it, it decreases the cost of having a doctor on call 24 7. they have I absolutely that. they bring in from outside many of whom do not know much about sickle cell disease. Right. And, and most of whom are not willing to follow the protocols because um, they just don't think they're necessary to follow. But well, they now, exist, and they exist in almost every hospital setting now. They do. Particularly adult facilities. Okay. But, you know, and I know you know this gentleman, Dr. Ari Hoffman and him and mm -hmm. Aileen, they, they were the hospitalists at UCSF, but they've gone off to do other things or mm -hmm. they're not necessarily doing that. And yeah. they were experts in the area of uh, sickle cell, mm -hmm. but I don't know, has anybody- but These are, these are non-experts. These are non-experts who may know nothing about sickle cell disease. They, they're not just seeing the sickle cell patients, they're seeing every patient that comes into the hospital. Okay, well, the people that, the two that I'm talking about, weren't they sickle cell? Yeah, they took, well, they took the time to learn more about sickle cell, but you're right, right they've also moved on. So let me just say another update, Nadina, <laughs> for the Bay Area is that um, uh, Dr. Walters uh, and I are actually meeting with the uh, Division of Hematology. They're, they have a new chief, and, you know, our our big negative aspect in the Bay Area has been that the adult hematology at UCSF hasn't been interested in sickle cell disease. I mean, just be honest. But we, we've had a meeting with that guy, the new guy, um, and we're going to meet with him again. 
and um, and we're going to really push improved care in San Francisco, not just in um, Oakland. So we are supporting this, the program at San Francisco General. We want to support the program at Parnassus. We want the Division of Hematology chief to take this on. And, and so that's, that's our plan there, that um, we know the care has been really bad. And, and, okay. and then another meeting that we have coming up um, at the end of this month is with um, hospitalists actually in the East Bay. So we're trying to get the word out. We're trying to get these um, education going. But again, you're all correct. We can educate all day long, but if there's no um, sort of, if there's no mandate that people have right. to do what we're describing, then it's going to fall continue to fall short. But we we'll start with the education, and then we need to take it, you know, to the next level where their leadership takes it on and says you have to do this. So, Absolutely. Okay. So, Marsha, I actually have a, a institution that wants to provide services to people with sickle cell disease and wants to start a center of excellence. How do you go about getting that done? Um, you could have them. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll also send the NA. The, well, you guys can have my slides. And so the NASAC website, they can uh, go to that website and submit an application to um you know to become a recognized comprehensive sickle cell center and and that would be a start and like i said we yeah so yeah so i would have them do that okay um there's a question about um transition um and and we've seen this before uh where you have uh, someone who is a specialist and then they leave and then there's no one who replaces them and and so I appreciate, Karen, that you brought that up. Uh, and, and fortunately, it is, it's where we have that lack of resources in sickle cell disease where you have, you know, provider and then they're gone and there's no one to replace them. So that's where we really have to work, you know, with leadership and have, if you're calling yourself a center, a sickle cell center, comprehensive sickle cell center, then you need to meet certain standards. And then I wasn't sure if Laetta um, had a question. Hi, Marcia. Um, Hi. First, I would <laughs> definitely like to say <laughs> that Children's has been wonderful. Of course, I've been dealing with this for 30 years now, but um, you know, you guys have been great to us. And now we're experiencing the adulthood part of it. And what I am noticing is that, um, and it's interesting because I also have some employees at my job too that have sickle cell. So I'm kind of like, you know, helping them along the way as well is the doctors are finding at least out here, cause you know, we're in the Valley now and that's been an issue, but it's one size fits all. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm hearing is that, you know, um, like some of the employees have said that, well, the doctor said that, well, my other patient, but, and so, you know, just oh, helping gosh. them advocate as well is that whatever your other patient with sickle cell had doesn't mean it fits this one. Right. I obviously, yeah, I have two children with yeah. sickle cell and they're totally different. So mm -hmm. I think that's that's really important. And I was just thinking that maybe having an advocate in the emergency room mm -hmm. is really important mm -hmm. because, you know, like I try to be there with my children, but that's not going to always be the case for everybody. Right. Yeah. If they have an advocate that can just someone that floats through the emergency room and it mm -hmm. doesn't just have to be for sickle cell, but obviously, cause that's the best way to get the funding is when you don't say a sickle cell, you say it's multiple programs, mm -hmm. but just having an advocate that can be in there to kind of push them through the process. Yeah. So just a couple of ideas. Yeah. I like that. I mean, I like that. I like that idea a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, mm -hmm. The, the other, you know, I hate, uh, well, I keep pointing to the uh, the Van Hollen bill because it has been well thought out um, yeah. if and if it if all goes well. And they really talk about the importance of the community-based organizations. And that's where you could have, you know, a, someone in the emergency room who can uh, really assist if you have this partnership between the community-based organizations and the clinical care program. Now, you know, we can we can't wait forever for this new funding to come through. So we have to try to make these some of these things happen now. 
And, um, you know, again, it does take advocacy, it takes education, um, um, it takes energy, and we just have to keep at it. It, it, it would be wonderful if, if that, you know, money could come through like now, <laughs> but it's not there. And, um, we, you know, anyway, that's the kind of thing exactly, it would, it would provide for exactly what you're saying, the partnership between the community-based organization and the clinical providers. So, so, right, so we're the boots on the ground and we're mm -hmm. the ones that are always interacting and engaging with the clients. Mm -hmm. We should have a seat at the table, just like if we were the CHW, we should be a part of the team. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely, mm -hmm. Nadina. Um, I don't know, for those of you who are on the call, um, hopefully you know that the state of California just gave Carolyn Raleigh money to put, to to increase services for people for sick, with sickle cell mm -hmm. disease throughout the state. Uh, she additionally has formalized a coalition of, of um, the, the uh, community-based organizations in order to really heighten uh, services to people with sickle cell disease. And so I would ask that you also um, make contact with her and because she has community health workers all over the state. Um, so just, you know, I think that we as a group need to work better so that we can provide better services for folks with sickle cell disease that, right. that, that we, if we unify, there's, there's, um, there's strength in numbers. I yes. agree. You know? I agree. Big time. And, um, and so it's, it's really time for some of the, there, there, there's sometimes things that go on within our leadership circle. Right. That, that prevent us from doing what we should be doing for people living with sickle cell disease. At, at no time should, should our, um, our relationships affect what we provide for individuals with sickle cell disease because right. we put, we're supposedly in it for them. Right. So, so I just want to encourage us to take a deeper look at what's happening in the state of California in terms of what we're doing that, that hinders what we provide to people with sickle cell disease uh, and to ensure that we look at even the, 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 the groups that we consider centers of excellence to ensure that they're providing what they should be providing because it shouldn't just stop in the clinic yeah. or in the sickle cell center. We should have influence in the healthcare system uh, as a whole. No, we really should. Yeah, because we're dealing with a whole person here, not just a person living in pain. There's a Absolutely. whole other, uh, you important. know, yeah. the entire person, and we people right. keep forgetting that. So. Yes, they yeah. do. They do. So, um, so yeah, no, I this has been a great uh, discussion, and I I have you know some ideas. I'll send the guidelines, uh, the contact related to uh, National Alliance of Sickle Cell Centers, and then also um, submit that you. Um, you know, the interest in participating um, because the NASAC is, is meant to be inclusive, not exclusive. Yeah. And I want to thank you so much, Marsha. You're welcome. Excellent, excellent presentation, Marsha. Definitely.